Some of you are awake. Merry Christmas. We celebrate our Savior who was born. And then we celebrate our risen Savior who died for us and, and rose again to redeem us from our sins. I, I believe Christmas is merry for this reason, because it is a day full of joy. We have been working through the Advent season and looking at the characters, the nature of who our God is. He is light. He is peace. And today we will look at this, that Jesus is our joy. So as we open up the, the word of God together, let's look at, through the lens of joy, the story of Christ. A personal story quickly. This is my first Christmas here in Birmingham area. And for someone who doesn't live in, who wasn't born in Moody, this is the Birmingham area still. Um, if you're not from Louisiana, we'll tell you we're from New Orleans. We're really not, but we're close. And I was so excited because I just figured, you know what? I'm going to finally get my white Christmas. And here we are 70 degrees later with the AC on. So I'm a little, in my suit, I dressed up and Greg dressed down to make everyone feel comfortable. So you're between one of us. Um, but with it being hot, I don't think I made the wisest choice in that. But Merry Christmas, a day full of joy and wonder and majesty. Why joy? I pray that today is full of joy for you. You know, we long for joy at Christmas. That's why we call it Merry Christmas and not Unmerry Christmas or just Christmas. That's why we sing songs of joy. We sing songs like joy to the world, the Lord is or has come, let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. Heaven and nature sing, heaven and nature sing, heaven and heaven and nature sing. Joy to the world, the Savior reigns. So we sing songs of joy, whether you believe it or not, we still sing those songs and you still love that song. There's another Christmas carol called Good Christian Men Rejoice. With heart and soul and voice, now ye hear of endless bliss. Joy, joy, Jesus Christ was born for this. So we naturally long for our time of Christmas to be one of joy. But joy is not confined to our lyrical reflections. The Holy Scriptures are also full of resounding joy. So listen to these Scriptures Isaiah 9, 3, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. And many of you know or have seen that three verses later, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And the increase of his peace, there will be no ends. For he is wonderful counselor, mighty God. He is everlasting father. He is prince of peace. Joy will be increased. Nehemiah 8.10 says it this way. Then Nehemiah said to them, go your way, eat the fat. Some of you are going to leave here today and eat the fat. Drink the sweet Send portions to those of whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord. Galatians 5, says this about joy. It is a fruit of the Spirit. So if joy is a fruit, then where does fruit come from? It comes from the root, and the root of the fruit is Jesus Christ. Christ. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And then Psalm 51 verse 12, written by David, when he was confronting his sin face to face. Now think about this. David Write Psalm 51 in response to his sin. And you say, well, how bad could his sin be? Well, he is unfaithful to his wife with a lady he sees bathing on the rooftop. And let me just say, public service announcement, look, don't bathe on the rooftop. It's not going to go well. Okay. 
So if you're thinking about doing that today, don't. That's my pastoral warning to you. But he's unfaithful to his wife with Bathsheba. And in that unfaithfulness, they find that she has conceived. In that unfaithfulness, he brings her husband who is home from war back, tells him to go spend time with your wife. Uriah, being a righteous man, doesn't spend time with his wife, but sleeps on the the welcome mat. Then he tries to get the husband drunk. That doesn't work, and so he kills the man. And in all of that, he's finally confronted with his sin, and he writes Psalm 51. It says, Father, against you and you only have I sinned. And then he says this in verse 12, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. So today we look at joy in our life. And you say, well, what is joy? We will define joy this way. Joy is an emotion in your soul produced by the spirit that leads you to the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ. Now, think about that. It's an emotion. So don't, don't get me wrong. So we're just going to, we're not going to be emotive people where we just feel what we want to feel today. Right now I'm hot. Tomorrow we're going to feel cold. That's weather. So we're not simply emotional people, but it's an emotion in our soul. You know, I can't change things in my soul. Only God can. Produced by the Spirit to lead us to the majesty of Jesus Christ. So why is joy important? We'll look at joy today in the narrative of Christ. One, God's word very clearly says that we are to do things that are outside of our control. That God's word presses us to do things that are, that are outside of us. That's why over and over again in the, the Christmas story, you have angels coming and telling the good news of Christ. And what is their one refrain over and over again to people? Do not fear. Why would they say that? Because they are afraid. So God's word challenges us to do things that is outside of our control. Often we say, well, I can't give. It's just not comfortable. Well, God has challenged us to do more than what is naturally comfortable. I can't share my faith. That is not natural for me. It's not natural. That's why it's spiritual. God is challenging us to do greater than we can do within ourselves. So may our joy be increased. It is outside and greater than who we are. It is an emotive response to our soul. Secondly, joy is always produced by the Spirit. Joy is always produced by the Spirit. We cannot manufacture joy in any way. You can't manufacture joy by some worship experience. Parents, you can't manufacture joy in your life and your kids' life by giving them presents. I was talking to a friend about five minutes ago, and they said, it's a Merry Christmas, so how was it? And they said, you know what? We gave our kids way too much, and the, the one thing that gave them the most happiness was a chapstick in their stocking. <laughs> Out of, I don't know, the hundreds of dollars we spend on our kids and grandkids and other people, the thing that brought them the most happiness was joy. Rose of chapstick. Why is that important? Because I think God is reminding us, look, I can't create joy for my kids. I can give them what I think they want and they'll be happy and tomorrow they're gonna go on to their old stuff. And they're gonna find the chapstick and say, this gives me the most happiness because we cannot manufacture joy. We can't do it through religious observance. We can't do it with their worship experience or Christmas carols or right moral living. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And so this morning, my prayer is that our joy may be increased. So let's pray and we will look at God's word. Father, we thank you that you are a God of joy. Lord, I thank you for the reminder that sometimes it's chapstick that brings the most happiness in this life. Lord, to refocus our hearts and minds knowing that we cannot manufacture joy, but it is produced by your spirit. So Lord, this morning, may you renew to us the joy of your salvation. Father, may the joy of the Lord be our strength. 
And Lord, today may you produce fruit in our lives of love and joy and peace. And may we be people marked by joy because joy is central to those who believe. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Um, Eric, I just want to say this. I don't have a clock back there, so I have unlimited time. So give me, give me a signal when we get to an hour. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to read God's word today with the lens of joy. Why? Because joy is an emotion in your soul produced by the Spirit that leads us to the majesty of Jesus Christ. So read the nativity through the lens of joy. Through the lens of joy. And we're going to see the joy of the Magi in verse 10 of chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Verse 10, when they saw the star, and this is the Magi, these are people who have traveled from the east, right? We three kings of Orient are those guys. So these are the kings of the Orient. When they saw the star in verse 10, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. So when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. Now, let me point out that they haven't seen Jesus yet. They haven't seen the baby. They just see a glimpse of something pointing to Christ and joy arises up in their soul. I believe we should be the same way. We find in the gospel of Matthew, the wise and upper class men of the world coming to see the king. If you will, we see in Matthew, the kings coming to see the king of kings. You know, we use the word kings, but Matthew never uses those words. They're really magi. And so what are these magi? They're people who study the universe and the movement of the planets. There are people who study the stars to find out what's going on in the world. But there are also people that's looking for redemption and hope and something more. And it's no accident that people who study the stars were giving what? God gave truth seekers that look at the stars a star to point to Jesus Christ. I love what God's word reminds us here. If you are honestly looking for truth, you will find it in Jesus Christ. And you might be here today and you say, you know what? I really enjoy looking at stars. And God says, fine, I'll give you a star. But the star is not the joy. The star is pointing you to something greater and the joy is Jesus Christ. There is joy in truth. That's my daughter right there. <laughs> Don't even have to look. We find joy in truth. It's interesting to me that the Magi come from Persia, which is a three to six month journey. Some of you thought you had a difficult time in traffic today coming to church. Think about seeing the star and saying, you know what? Let's saddle up the donkeys. You know, let's get on the camels and let's, let's go to see this, this child that gives us hope. And by the way, it's a three to six month journey. And when they get there, by the way, Persia's in modern day Iran. Think about where all the turmoil right now in our, in our world. That even in turmoil, God is bringing joy and peace. We find in the Magi truth seekers, gazers of the star. So here is their joy. If you are seeking truth, you will find it. If you are seeking truth, you will find it in a manger. And his name is Jesus Christ. If you are seeking truth today, you, there is great joy in that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. We see joy in the Magi because they sought truth and they found it. His name is Jesus Christ. Are you looking for truth? May we be truth seekers. Turn with me to Luke chapter two. We find joy in the Magi. Luke two and verse 13, where we'll spend the rest of our time. Next, we see joy in the life of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, it's interesting that for Zechariah and Elizabeth, 
we find these two people in the story of the birth of Christ. Because these are people that can't have a child. So we find barren people in the story, the birth narrative. And you say, well, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't because it's God. Right? Things with God often don't make sense to us mentally, cognitively, because God calls us to do something greater than we have. Joy is an emotion in your soul produced by the Spirit. So let's look at Luke 2, verse 13 and 14. Zechariah and Elizabeth. And I ask you to look through the lens of joy and ask this question, why would this couple past the prime of their baby years be in the birth story of Jesus? Be in the birth story of Jesus. Luke 2, 13. Actually, I'm in chapter one. We'll be in Luke two. Hold that thought. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm so excited. We're gonna look at the shepherds later. Luke chapter one, verse 13. The angel said to him, that is Zacharias, do not be afraid. Why? Because he's afraid. We, we, we gloss over that. So God often calls us to do things that we cannot do naturally because it is supernatural. It is spiritual. Your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you shall call his name John. Now you might be thinking, well, why, why is this important? How long has he been praying for this? Verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife, he wanted to be nice here. He didn't call her old. My wife is well advanced. She's wise beyond her years. Smart man, that Zechariah, right? But let me tell you something about being advanced in age in the ancient Near East. This would make them 60 years or older. They weren't 30 thinking, you know what? If we have a child now, I'm going to be gray hair when my, when my son is graduating. I'm going to be Papa when he walks across the stage. No, they're grandparents. So why would God put grandparents that cannot have children in the narrative of Christ? I believe we see in Zechariah and Elizabeth a couple who had given up on their personal hopes, dreams for their family. I believe we have a couple that he's been praying for a child for many, many years. But when you get to 60, you really give up on that being answered. Can you imagine them going to Passover every year, a time of family and, and playing with other people's kids and, and having a, a longing heart and the times of holidays being difficult for Zacharias and Elizabeth because they don't have the kid they've longed for. The dream that they want for themselves is not the dream that has been, they've been living or been realized. The things that they've longed for, the hopes, now don't get me wrong, they haven't given up on God. They haven't given up on the Lord. They've just given up on their dreams. And I'm reminded often, I was reminded this week, I've had at least three people near to me that have lost someone this week, a close family member. You know, often... Our lives of the Christmas season are not happy because we experience a loss. And I believe Zacharias and Elizabeth speak to those of you who are hurting today, who this Christmas is a difficult Christmas because you are without your dad or your mom or your wife, or you're grieving because you don't have kids that you can, you can bestow gifts on. You've been praying and saying, Lord, give me the joy that we hear about. Lord, give me the happiness that we see about in the holidays. Lord, I'm going to Passover constantly. Lord, I'm creating my booth at the Feast of Sukkot with, with happiness and joyous times. But Lord, I'm not joyful because my dreams aren't what I thought they should be. And I believe God still says to us, to you, you can find joy this time because Christ gives us joy. And so if today you've walked in here with a heavy heart, I pray that you will leave here joyful because God renews your strength. 
that we would not just turn a blind eye to difficulty and hurting in our life, that we would not turn a blind eye to Zechariah and Elizabeth and say, you know what, 60 years old, you've been struggling with this. You can't have kids. Get over it. But that we look at them and find hope and redemption and restoration. We see joy in Zechariah and Elizabeth. Are you brokenhearted, disappointed, experiencing loss this season? Listen to the joy of Zechariah. You will rejoice. Jesus was born for this time and to redeem and change your hurts, your losses, and your disappointments. May you find joy that we see in Zechariah. Do not fear, but rejoice because he is the joy giver. Look with me at the joy of John the Baptist. We see joy in the Magi. We see joy in Zechariah and Elizabeth. Hear the joy of John the Baptist. Luke 1, 44. Hear the joy of John the Baptist. Now, you know, John the Baptist is a cousin of Jesus Christ. And Mary is on her way to see her cousin because her cousin's going through exactly the same thing that she's going through. They're both with child. And in verse 44, when they come together, indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, Elizabeth said, the babe leapt. Now think about that. As soon as Mary and Elizabeth meet and the babe in Elizabeth's womb hears the sound of Mary, the babe leaped, but that's not the end of the scripture. Look at the joy of John the Baptist. The John the Baptist leapt in her womb for joy. Blessed is he, she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of these things which were told to her from the Lord. And I ask you, why would John jump for joy? Why would this child leap? First, I believe he was overjoyed to be near the Savior. We see this in John the Baptist. We find joy when we are near Christ. You find joy when you are near Christ. I love the story of Christmas, the story of Advent. The wise men are overjoyed, not because they have seen Jesus yet, because they see the star. And John the Baptist leaps in his mother's womb, not because he sees Christ, because he what? He hears the voice of her mom. There's something beautiful and wonderful being near Christ. And the joy of Advent is this. God says to us, draw near to me and I will do what? I will draw near to you. Second, I believe that the spirit produced joy in John's soul because John had found his purpose. John had found his purpose. You see, the purpose of John was to make straight the paths in the wilderness. And you say, well, that's an awesome task. I would love to be John the Baptist. Okay, why don't you go live in the desert and eat locusts and honey? And you can wear camel's clothes. That's not a job most of us sign up for. But joy was found in John's life, I believe, when he knew that his purpose had arrived. There is joy when we match glorifying God. I believe the purpose of the believer is this. Lord, as we see in, in Romans, Father, let my life be worshiped to you. That when my life is worshiped to Christ, it's my spiritual act of worship, there is joy in that. So are you living out your purpose in Christ? Parents, if you have your children here, I'm so thankful they are here with you, aggravating you right now because our kids need to see us worship. And they just don't need to see us stand here methodically and sing. They need to see joy in our life. They need to see that when we get near to Christ, joy is produced. And there are times where we're solemn and, and we put on sackcloth and ashes because repentance of our sin. But when we come together as a body of Christ, there, this should be a wonderful, momentous occasion because joy wells up in our soul even if you have to take your kids outside like mine are right now. But to see our children see you worship. And let me say this. We have a couple here today that have celebrated this week their 67th year of marriage. Not life, a marriage. 
What, what great joy is that? And I'm thankful for those faithful couples that younger, younger couples can see faithfulness. That they can see, look, through the good times, we stayed committed. Through the bad times, we stayed committed because there is joy in our relationships. If you are married, that is a purpose that you live out. Your marriage is a sign to the world of, of the covenant that we have of Jesus Christ. There is joy in our purpose, living with Christ. So I say this, see John, hear John, live for joy, draw near to Christ, live your purpose, share the good news. What great joy we see in John the Baptist. And lastly, let us look at the joy of the shepherds. The joy of the shepherds. I jumped here to the first because this is our last. Verse 10 of chapter 2. The joy of the shepherds. So we've already seen in the narrative story that there were wise men from the east that shouldn't have been there. Why would God call people from Persia to the, to the throne of the king of the Jews? Why would God call two barren grandparent aged people into the narrative birth of the son? And why would God call shepherds into the story of his son? Verse 10 of chapter 2. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. Now, have you heard that before? Let me just say this. Anytime someone sees an angel in scripture, in God's word, the initial reaction is not, oh, look how cute. Look at that beautiful harp they're playing. Our response to the holiness of God and to a messenger of holiness is what? This is not good. I deserve to die. And so God's response is always, look, get yourself together. Do not be afraid. And we see this in the message. Do not be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Now, who are all people? We are. We're them. We it. Right? We are, and so you say, why, why is that important? Listen to the shepherds. In the first century, shepherds were the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. They were typically uneducated, poor, and lived among their animals in the elements, sometimes, most often, smelling like the animals. Most did not own land, so they grazed their flocks on the land of their neighbors, creating tension. Shepherds were tolerated but not esteemed by their neighbors and the general population. In some of the Babylonian tracts we have from that time, we see this about the court documents. Shepherds were dishonest and unclean according to the standards of the law. They, were, they represented the outcasts and the sinners of whom Jesus came. They were not allowed to give witness in court. So why would these outcasts be at the story of our Savior? Because Luke tells us that the shepherds were invited so that the world would know that all are invited. And you might say, well, you know what? I, I, I'm uneducated. You're in good company. You might say, well, you know what? I, I, I'm struggling to pay my bills. I'm at the lower end of the economic status. You're in good company. You might say, you know what? I kind of smell like an animal right now. You're in good company. You might say, well, you know, I'm kind of fighting with my neighbor. We got that covered. You might say, well, I just, I'm just dejected. You know, I have a bad reputation because of things I've done in the community, and I can't get over that. You're in good company because God reminds us there is joy. Why? Because this Savior has come to all people. So listen to the joy of the shepherds that unto you today in the city of David, a Savior has been born, and he will be great joy for all people. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. See the joy of the shepherds that no matter who you are, you can find redemption and forgiveness in this child. What great joy there is in the story of Christ. If you've walked in here on your high horse thinking you're a king, 
the Magi says, you know what, even kings should bow down to the king of kings. Maybe you're here and you're that truth seeker. You say, I, I, I'm a skeptic, I don't know, I, I struggle, but I'm, I'm honestly seeking truth. You will find truth in that manger. And there is joy in that. Maybe you're here and today is a difficult day because you experience loss, death, and grief. Or maybe the dreams you had for your life are not what you're living today. There is joy in the Lord in spite of that. And maybe you're here and you say, you know what, I don't have a good reputation. My family's disowned me. I'm just struggling. Let the shepherds remind you there is joy for a savior has been born to all people. And not all, but they are all welcome into the throne of Christ. There is great joy in the Lord. If you do not know that joy, may you respond. God's word reminds us this, that wherever confession and forgiveness is found, grace abounds more. How can David say, Lord, renew to me the joy of my salvation because he had repented of his sin? So if you need to do that today, if you seek forgiveness, he will forgive you and grace will abound more than your sin. Maybe you're here today and you just need to say, Lord, restore to me your joy. Father, renew that to me. Do not miss a chance to respond to the glorious news that he is our joy. He is our hope. Let's pray together. Father.